Splidge the Cragflinger The Royal Tournament by Richard Vobes Read by Richard Vobes Six o'clock in the morning brought a rumbling and clatter of chains from the palace gatehouse and the drawbridge came hurtling down. Below, somewhere in the bowels of the sandstone edifice, laboured a man named Perch, the royal gatekeeper. Scrawny, decrepit, but incredibly tough, he wound the handles that raised and lowered the entrance platform across the deep stagnant moat. The royal household could visit the city, and the Guddian citizens were able to venture across to the palace. Perch greeted the early flow of traffic that had business to conduct in the ancient stone building. Morning, Perch, said Mrs Mullins, the fruit and vegetable seller, as she pushed her barrow over the drawbridge. Another day greets us with all its joys. Aye, that it does, the royal servant replied. He poked a couple of turnips and scanned the promising fruit, seeking something tasty for his breakfast. I've got some nice plums for the royal gad this morning, if he's interested, announced the haggard woman. Oh, he'll be interested. You know him. He eats anything. Mrs Mullins pushed off and headed for the royal kitchen. Twin circular sandstone towers, separated by a central arch, greeted visitors. Like the rest of the palace, the main entrance, once described as a stunning example of Gothic perpendicular, had crumbled. It stood covered in moss, bereft of plaster and veined with deep cracks, and looked like it might disintegrate any moment into a huge pile of rubble. Time, the weather, but mostly neglect, had robbed the brilliance from the whole palace, leaving it frayed and shabby. If much of the luster on the outside had gone, the same could be said for those who worked inside. They too were well past their sell-by date. Splidge looked up at the imposing building. Nervously, he crossed the drawbridge and approached the wizened gatekeeper. What do you want? Perch asked. I'd like to see the king, please. The servant shook his head. You're too early. The king won't see anyone yet. Go away, little boy, and if you must, come back in an hour. Oh, and you can't wait here, if that's what you're thinking. Look, there's a tavern opposite. Go and annoy them. Perch growled at the boy, and then vanished into the control room to start winding up the handles again. The drawbridge started to rise up, so Splidge quickly ran back to the edge and jumped off. He landed on the muddy bank opposite and slipped down, narrowly avoiding the moat. As he climbed back up, Splidge spotted the alehouse and thought it would be good to get out of the rain for a while and dry his wet clothes. Perhaps a warming drink might calm his nerves before meeting the great man. King Charles Gudamac II had inherited ultimate power, but only just. The councillors had left when they had not been paid in years, the official advisers had resigned or died from old age, and the royal protectors, the once highly esteemed Guddian army, had been sent away to war. The kingdom had run out of money, and without gudders in the bank, the city had fallen apart. Yet, despite all this, the royal gud was the supreme ruler of this dishevelled land. As a young prince, Charles Guddamack had been keen and eager to help improve conditions, but when his elder brother, Ralph, had gone away to fight in the wars, it had drained all the finances. Normally, winning a war resulted in riches and spoils, but no one knew whether they had won or not. King Ralph and his army had never returned, so Charles had to take charge. The first problem he wanted to tackle was sanitation. The metropolis needed cleaning, the streets required paving, and water conduits screamed out for repairs. Plague, disease and death lurked around every corner, and the continual rain and lack of sunshine made everyone miserable. Mr Wren had begged an audience with the new king. The architect was full of optimism and had a grand vision. 
I have plans to make this city great again, Mr Wren said as he rolled out a large blueprint for the royal gud to examine. Indeed, the plans proved the city could be magnificent, ambitious and thoroughly beautiful. His new wide, clean streets radiating from the palace complex with avenues of lime, willow and ash would all look breathtaking. On paper, the artist's illustrations were extremely detailed and inspirational. But without the necessary cash, it remained a distant pipe dream. The kingdom was bankrupt. King Guddamak could not peer through the large, oblong-shaped window of the throne room on account of his size. Since coming to power, he had discovered a passion for food, and he ate. In fact, he could not stop his incessant eating. It had become so habitual that his mouth did not feel right unless it had food in it. His body weight had tripled, no, quadrupled, and he had blown up like a barrage balloon. The king was by far the most fattest man in all of Gud. So vast was his bulk that he rarely left his specially adapted throne, and it was only with the help of a series of mirrors, magnifying optics, and a cleverly designed mechanical counter-lever system that the royal gud could manipulate his view and enjoy the comings and goings of the outside world. And what he did see depressed him. Something must be done he bemoaned to the elderly gent who held the royal brush and stood patiently by the steaming tin bath in the dark recesses of the throne room. I have observed a carcass of a cow, half a dozen pigs in varying states of decay, and an inordinate amount of feathers deposited in the moat this morning. I take it the pheasant pluckers have been up to their old tricks again? We must have it dredged, Groggins." "'No one will go near the moat, your royal gaddiness," the elderly brush-holder remarked. "'For goodness' sake, why not, man?' "'Well, the stench, for one thing.' The king nodded. It was the reason why the throne room had been moved to the third floor of the palace, although when the wind blew from the wrong direction, the noisome smells wafted in nonetheless. The servant continued. The fear of drowning for another. Rubbish. The mud on the bank is binding and thick, and it would suck you under. It's like quicksand, your royal gardeners. A boy of nine rolled into the moat only a week ago and was covered in the putrid slime in no time. They couldn't pull him out, and he sunk beyond help. His mother was distraught. And no doubt blames me, the king sighed. She does. Groggins, what can we do? How do we rectify this ridiculous situation? You need to earn some money, your royal gaddiness. What I need is a miracle. The king scowled and looked to the heavens. The wrinkled servant picked up a towel the size of a house and crossed to the supreme leader, who struggled out of his chair and lifted his bulk onto his weak, podgy legs and started to undress. The royal bath was due. The simple act of walking caused the king pain, and his face crumpled. However, the reward proved blissful when his pink, blubbery, naked form finally immersed into the warm bath water. Groggins, his manservant, lathered up the king's pot-marked husk of skin, and using the long-handled brush, he briskly exfoliated the mountainous flab. And as he did so, there was a hideous explosion of soap bubbles as King Guddamak let rip a series of flatulent escapes. The poor cleaner was engulfed in a stifling cloud of rotten eggs. He gagged and fought back the desire to spew up his breakfast over his shameless employer. A bell rang in the distance and the king pricked up his ears. It's Tubby. Go to the window and call him up, Groggins. But you're in the bath, your royal gardeners. Who cares? I am the king, and I can do as I please. Besides, he's bringing me something special to try. The king splashed like an overgrown baby, sending water and bubbles everywhere. The newcomer dutifully made his way to the side entrance of the palace, as Groggins had requested. After climbing three flights of stairs, Tubby 
entered the royal chamber and cowered in front of the undulating, soap-covered mound of royal jelly. Oh, uh, your royal goddess, you're in the bath. Uh, sh should I call back when it's more convenient? Oh, piffle, said the king, splashing water over his gigantic stomach and then picking out a long length of fluff from his belly button. He eagerly turned to the visitor. Have you brought it? Tubby nodded. Uh, yes, your royal goddess, I have a firkin in my bag. The smartly dressed visitor removed a rucksack from his back and pulled out a small wooden barrel the size of a rugby ball. And I have a sampling glass too, he said, rummaging some more. I don't need that. Just give me the cask. The king sounded impatient, so Tubby quickly removed the bung at the top of the barrel and handed the container over. The king's fat fingers clasped the firkin with all the pretense of a wine connoisseur, and he thrust his bulbous nose against the hole and sniffed the hoppy aroma inside. Mmm, ale, real ale! The aromatic fusion of floral hops and the earthy scent of malted barley sent the king into raptures. Without further ado, he tipped the dark ale into his gaping mouth, swilled it around his capacious cheeks, then swallowed the lot. He emptied the firkin and belched with satisfaction, smacking his slug-like tongue around the rim, hunting for more. "'Twas good, Tubby!' He slapped an approving, soapy hand on the arm of the man in front of him. Tubby Drake was the landlord of the Hog and Bucket, the tavern which stood close to the palace gates on the city side of the moat. Tubby had petitioned King Gudamac to allow him to make a festive beer for the forthcoming royal tournament, and it thrilled him that the great man liked the sample he had brought along. But there was a problem. Another person had the sole rights to brew all the ale in Gud. To get round that, Tubby proposed that he would prepare a special one-off beer for the big event. It would make a change from the usual slop he was compelled to serve to his customers. I'm pleased your royal goddess enjoyed it. May I take that as confirmation of an order? It's a novel idea, Tubby. We could certainly do with something more flavoursome than the normal bilge the baron brews. The king glanced round for his butler, but Groggins had disappeared. Pass me my towel, would you, Tubby? The publican passed the massive sheet to the royal gud, who wrapped the huge towel around himself and struggled to get out of the bath. Give me a hand, would you, Tubby? Tubby obeyed, taking a firm hold of the king's hand, and, with as much strength as he could muster, heaved the king from the skip-sized tank. Just as the king got out, Tubby's shoes lost their grip and he went skating across the wet marble floor and smashed into the oak-panelled wall, giving him a bloodied nose. King Gudamac waddled behind a gold-coloured screen to get dressed. Perhaps we could try your tasty brew at my welcome feast in a couple of weeks. Could you have it ready by then? Tubby Drake's face lit up and he forgot about his nose. Uh, yes, of course, your royal goddess. I'll make sure it's ready. Very well, then, get to it. Uh, but, Tubby, a word of caution. King Gadamac poked his fat face out from behind the screen. Keep it under your hat. If the Baron finds out I've granted you permission to brew beer, there will be hell to pay. He doesn't like anyone else doing it, and life is short enough without suffering his gripes. The publican bowed, thrilled his idea had been accepted, and he left as eagerly as he had arrived. King Gudamac was soon dressed, and lowered his flabby bottom back onto the royal throne. He peeked into his special cantilevered mirror arrangement and observed the weather. Dark, menacing clouds approached, and he shivered at the prospect. The king tugged his oversized fur-lined waterproof royal coat tightly around him, Extra protection inside the palace was essential because the roof had a tendency to leak. And as if to demonstrate that very point, a droplet of water landed with a splash on his head and trickled down his neck. Legends told of long-lost kingdoms with impressive regal buildings and magnificent circular towers. Sadly, Palace Gud 
could not make such grand or sumptuous claims. Shoddy stonework, missing roof slates and leaking walls summed up the royal home. To combat the damp, King Gudamak had installed a central heating system. It consisted of a maze of antiquated lead pipes snaking around the interior, warming up flaky iron radiators. Hot water used to be pumped through this gruesome monstrosity and, for a short time, it actually raised the internal temperature of the ramshackle edifice. Irritatingly, it had packed up a year to the day after its installation and proved far beyond the royal finances to repair it. Money, money, money. The king needed it desperately. An event occurring every six years brought in such money. The Royal Tournament, a bizarre and frankly quite peculiar competition, took place on City Hill. Somehow it had become the national sport of Gud. This year, the newly constructed arena building would host the Games and over 10,000 people were expected to attend. With the cash raised from ticket sales alone, Mr Wren's dream of the perfect city could really happen. The Royal Tournament lasted three days. The festivities required an enormous amount of organisation and created brisk trade and high employment. Artisans and shopkeepers enjoyed a boost and general spirits rose, with the usual daily drudgery turning into a joyous celebration. But the King had a serious problem. He remembered a meeting with the official tournament judges the week before. A bunch of dusty legal gentlemen, wearing heavy cloaks and thick powdered wigs, had surrounded the royal throne. Each man clasped a stack of books and several scrolls. The games cannot take place unless the king has an official player, one of them had said. The king must be represented in the royal tournament by a royal contender. King Gudamak shook his head and beat the arms of his chair with annoyance. I no longer have one. I keep telling you, the fella died. But the rules are very clear. They were drawn up over 300 years ago. I know that. The king's voice boomed around the room and he rose from his chair in frustration. I had the very man. He was excellent and would have won the tournament. But he contracted the plague and snuffed it. The lawyers gasped at the mention of the word plague, but shrugged all the same. Look, continued the king, the unfortunate blighter developed black pustules in his armpits and had green pus oozing from his face. I smelt it. It was vile. The poor chap lived for three weeks until one day his belly exploded and his intestines decorated the front room of his house. One of the legal men lost control of his bladder at that point and a pool of water appeared on the floor. I'm sorry he died, but you will need to find a new player. In exasperation, the king pounded his fist on one of the fluted columns that held up the roof and a flurry of plaster sprinkled down from above. No one will do it. I've been advertising for weeks. Since the death of that wretched fellow, everyone thinks he got infected here. The man's wife told me, to my face, that rather than work here at the palace, she would prefer to go and live in a leper colony or bathe every day in the stinking moat. Then you'll have to cancel the tournament, the oldest legal man stated firmly. The ancient book decrees that without a recognised royal player there can be no competition this year. Quite so, the others agreed, nodding vigorously. The king glared at the wise men with their powdered wigs and thick, musty books. Then we must wait a further six years for the next games, and by then we shall be totally bankrupt. I will be forced to abdicate and you all know who will resume control of the kingdom then. The huddle of legal men stood open-mouthed, not daring to speak. The king smirked back at them. That's right, my half-brother, the Baron. The lawyers recoiled at the mention of that name and began to shake, and fine white chalk clouds puffed from their comic headpieces. But, but, one of them whimpered, there's still time, your royal gutterness. Please keep looking for a royal player. 
you must find someone who will all perish at the hands of the baron. The king told them that he would do his best. The encounter had taken place seven days ago, and still the post had not been filled.